Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I'm here with uh, my new friend Chuck, and uh, Chuck just got here recently. Was it from New York City or? Uh, no, no, from Tennessee. From Tennessee, okay. From Tennessee, and um, you've been here for how long? Uh, since May 27th. May 27th. So a few weeks now. May 27th, and you've got a really interesting uh, career back in America. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Yeah, well, I'm the president of the National Association of Fugitive Recovery Agents, uh, and also our international division, which is the International Bounty Hunter Union. Um, so we're a membership organization of people that are uh, in the field of bail bond fugitive recovery in the U.S. And in the international realm, we have people, uh, members in multiple countries, and we tend to work off of the Rewards for Justice program. So these are, you know, terrorists, uh, you know, war crimes, uh, you know, human traffickers, things like that that the governments uh, are interested in apprehending, and the rewards tend to be higher. You know, we're talking anywhere from a million to seven million dollars. Uh, so it's worth a bit of investment, you know, for us to run some operations and try to locate these guys. So you um, go to like a data bank and say, okay, let's go after this guy. And then you set up a whole plan to go after them, or? Yeah, yeah, I like the Rewards for Justice program has a, their own website. They list all the different fugitives that are on there. Um, and with my background in the bail bond fugitive recovery, I made a lot of contacts uh, in foreign countries because we had guys that sk skip bond that would run off to other countries. So over time, um, we had you know these guys join our national association, even though they were based in other countries, because if we had a guy that skipped off to like France or Mexico or wherever, um, we would then be able to use them as a resource. So back in uh, 2019, when we expanded into the international realm, um, I had actually gone for a meeting at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, in the Netherlands, uh, and they were looking for some assistance there uh, for some of the people that they had been looking for for a very long time. So, um, you know, I got a, with our, you know, stakeholders and talked about it, and I said, I think we really need to form an international branch or division um, so that we can sort of work these cases because the rewards are really high. Um, so that's when we formed the International Bounty Hunter Union, um, sort of under the umbrella of our national association, and we sort of ran from there. Uh, and You know, we've been doing pretty well running in operations. I've got one going in Somalia right now, which I've been funding out of my own pocket. It's kind of a dangerous place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I haven't personally set foot in the country, um, but I actually have guys there that work for me that are we're running this operation. Um, we're looking for a gentleman by the name of Jihad Mustafa. So if any of you guys know where Jihad Mustafa <laughs> is hiding in Somalia, feel free to hit me up. Uh, but yeah, we're running an operation. There's several, you know, different people that we're looking for at any given time, but this is one of our primary operations that we're now, who, now who pays you when you have a, you actually capture a fugitive? Who pays you, the government that wants them, or? No, well, the Rewards for Justice program has a fund, and it's, okay. it's administered by the U.S. State Department, but it actually came from private benefactors oh. uh, that funded this. And I think that it's about $150 million that they've paid out so far, not to us, but in general. Uh, so, yeah, the money is there. You just, once you, you know, can demonstrate that you've actually captured them or you've actually orchestrated the capture, located the person and, you know, involved the proper authorities to make the apprehension, you can put in an application for a reward. And the Secretary of State is actually the one that reviews it and has to sign off on it. And, uh, you know, the reward may be up to $7 million. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get $7 million. You know, you might get $1 million, you might get half a million. Depends on, you know, they might look at it and say, okay, you know, this is your role. You know, we think that your role deserves this pay uh, or this amount of reward. So it's, it's very, it's kind of arbitrary. You really don't know what it's going to be until, you know, the, it's all is said and done. So when you capture a guy, what happens next once you've got the guy? Uh, no, we're, we're talking about in the international realm. Yeah. Right? Okay. Uh, well, generally what we try to do is involve the authorities in the country where they're located. Um, now, you take some place like Somalia, there's vast parts of the country where the government really doesn't have any control. Uh, so in a situation like that, you know, you would make the, you know, make the capture and you would coordinate, you know, to bring that person somewhere of a competent jurisdiction where you can actually turn them over. Um, you know, if that person doesn't have a passport or something like that, you're not going to just going to show up at the airport and say, hey, we're going to fly them off to the U.S. where they're wanted. Uh, you've got to go through the proper channels, you know, there's the extradition and that type of thing. So tell me about somebody that, um your last big capture that was in another country? Well, we were um, involved in locating Felicia and Kabuga, who was one of the people that orchestrated the Rwanda genocide. Um, you know, our people located uh, him in France. We're talking back in uh, May of 2020. 
Um, and that was like one of the first big cases that we were involved with that we were working on. And, you know, we have some members in South Africa, uh, one of our members there who was uh, former military intelligence, who had some contacts in Kigali in Rwanda and uh, basically went there and did the old fashioned boots on the ground, you know, gumshoe type detective work and located some people that were familiar with him and his family. And they said that he had a daughter in France. And it was almost like it was common knowledge, like this is where he probably is. And he'd been looking for him for over 20 years. Excuse me. Uh, so he basically did some skip trace work and coordinated with some of our members over there in France. And they were able to locate the daughter and set up surveillance. And uh, eventually they saw this older gentleman walking with her and they were able to ascertain that it was that was him um, from there they turned it over to the gendarmerie which is the french police gave them all the intelligence all the information um, and from there they ran with it they coordinated um, you know with the criminal tribunal there so our role was you know basically skip tracing our people never actually put hands on this guy uh, but we located where he was and turned that information over to the proper authorities. Now, in America, when you're a bounty hunter, um, I assume you're armed, you have a gun and... Yeah, yeah, generally speaking, you know, you're armed. Um, you know, there it's, it's, it's regulated in most states. You know, you have to have a license. Um, you know, Can you some, go across state lines? Like, you operate out of, where do you operate out of now? Yeah, well, I mean, these days, you know, because I'm the president of the union and the National Association, I don't do too much field work. Mm -hmm. uh, but the guys that are actually out in the field day to day, you know, they have to be licensed in the state that they're working in. Some states require a license. Some states require a certification. Um, some states don't require anything. They leave it up to the bail bond company who they want to hire. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a maze of different regulations. Like, uh, you know, say you're a bounty hunter in Tennessee, you can't go to North Carolina unless you're licensed there. Um, so what they generally would do is bring in some agents from Cal North Carolina to go and work with them and work under their license and let them make the apprehension. So if you're, you're tracking a guy, like say it's from Kentucky, wanted in Kentucky, and you're following him, you got him, you know, you're about ready to capture him, and he just gets in his car and drives across the bridge into Indiana, he's home free, you can't do anything? Well, I mean, it, if you have somebody that's licensed working with you, that's licensed in Indiana, you can. Or if they're in NCIC and they're extraditable, you can just notify the local police and usually they'll step in and they'll, you know, they can enforce that warrant if it's an NCIC, it's extraditable. Um, like Kentucky is the one example of a state that doesn't have commercial bail. Like that's a tough one because, because they don't have any commercial bail, they don't recognize or have any laws on the books to allow a fugitive recovery agent or a bounty hunter to make an apprehension. You know, if I was to go to Kentucky as a bounty hunter and arrest somebody, they would charge me with kidnapping um, because there's no laws on the books in Kentucky that allow it. Uh, so the only way to grab somebody out of Kentucky is if they have to be extraditable in NCIC and you notify the local police or the, even the local constable there um, and get them to make the actual arrest. Um, and then they would go in front of a judge there and they would you know, have an extradition hearing. So how did you get into this first of all? You say you, before you had a background in law enforcement? Yeah, well actually I started out as a process server and I was out, you know, I, I saw something on television about process serving. I thought, oh, this seems interesting. We go around and serve papers and room people stay, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went out and I was serving papers. And I was down at the courthouse because a lot of times I had to file the affidavit of service. That was one of the things I would do for my clients. So uh, I met some bail bondsmen down at the courthouse. And I got struck up a conversation. And, you know, they asked me what I was doing. And they said, well, you know, you, part of what you do is finding people, right? I mean, when you're trying to serve papers, sometimes people are hiding from you. Yeah, it's same thing with us you know when people skip bond we have to go and find them and I said well I'd be interested in trying that out so the bondsman sort of gave me a chance he didn't pay me a damn cent <laughs> but I learned a lot you know in the beginning I didn't make any money at it uh, but I was out there he showed me the ropes you know he give me a file like hey see if you can find out where this guy is at you find him let me know we'll go get him so and then I would tag along you know when you start out you're kind of like the guy that's watching the back door um, and then that's how I got my start and then eventually I went for some training, um, I got certified. Um, I ended up getting a contract uh, with a, the actual insurance company that backs the bail bond companies. Um, a company called Harco Insurance uh, was the insurer for um, a bail bond company called Capital Bonding. Mm -hmm. Capital Bonding went out and run, you know, wrote hundreds of millions of dollars in bonds and then they went bankrupt. And a lot of their clients didn't show up for court because it was bad underwriting. So Harco formed a company called Surety Administrators for the sole purpose of 
clearing up all these forfeitures. So I was hired by surety administrator. She had been a contract, um, and I had a ton of cases. I had more cases than I could handle. I had to subcontract a lot of cases out. Um, and that's where I really got my start and really started to make some real money. Wow. Okay, so we changed locations, a little bit noisy back where we were. Um, so tell me, um, as a bail bondsman, have you ever had any dangerous situations where something went wrong or you, somebody shot a gun at you or <laughs> you had to pull your gun out or anything yeah. like that scary happened? Yeah, I mean, people value their freedom above all else. So when you come to take away someone's freedom, uh, there are times where the fight or flight mechanism kicks in and uh, you know they, they decide to fight or you know, some of them are just career criminals you know and violence is what they're about so yeah I have, I've had plenty of situations where I've been you know injured and you know dangerous things have happened and I had to have surgery <laughs> well, tell me about one of the things where you got injured what happened yeah uh, well one of the situations was involved a fugitive that we set up on him and we were dressed as utility workers mm -hmm. had a clipboard and uh, Basically, we're doing surveillance on his place because the particular neighborhood where this guy lived, we didn't really fit in. Um, but as utility workers, we could sort of blend in anywhere. We're sort of invisible. So uh, and this guy had some pretty violent charges. So long story short is he showed up and, you know, we walked up on him and went to gra we grabbed him, went to cuff him. And this guy fought like hell, fought like hell. Um, he had a knife on him. So we're basically trying to grab the knife and grab his arm, get the knife away. So I ended up inju getting, injuring my leg. I ended up having to have surgery on my leg, uh, you know, after the whole incident was done and over with. And, you know, and the thing is, like, in that line of work, you're considered an independent contractor. So you don't have any, you know, workers' compensation insurance or anything like that. So, you know, if you get injured, you know, it all falls on you. You know, if you're not able to work for a while, uh, you just got to take that loss. But, yeah, we've had, had guys pull out weapons on us and things like that. I mean, over time... I adjusted my tactics, you know, I, I try to be what's my, what you might refer to as low impact. Rather than kicking somebody's door in and just having to guess what's on the other side of it, because you don't know what they've got in there, um, we'll do a lot of surveillance and wait for somebody to come and try to grab them outside. You know, if you kick somebody's door in, who knows what they got on the other side of that door. You know, you're sort of in their castle, in their domain. They know what's where. Well, can you do that? You kick in somebody's door? Yeah, I mean, did you have a search warrant to do that? Or? No, if we, if we know that they're in there, you know, and we, we can force entry in most states. Every state has their own regulations, but uh, and some limit that to some extent. But, you know, in, in most jurisdictions, if we actually see them in there, we can force entry into the to the dwelling. Wow. Um, you ever had anybody shoot at you? No, I haven't had anybody shoot at me, but I have had people point weapons at me. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, and I've had people that probably would have shot me if they had the opportunity. Now, so when, when you're dealing, going back overseas in other countries, do you have access to weapons there or do you have to go in unarmed? No, we have, to follow the, we have to follow the laws in each individual jurisdiction we go to, whether it be another state or another country. Um, you know, internationally, most countries, I think the Philippines is probably the only other country where you can actually do bounty hunting legally, where you can actually make an apprehension under certain circumstances, but most countries don't allow it. So when we're going into other countries, we're more or less skip tracing people for the most part. We're locating, you know, where they're located, getting the proper authorities involved. Um, the only exception would be in a lawless place. You know, there are some countries where they have areas that are not controlled by the government. So it's, you know, you have no choice but to go hands on at something like that. Well, um, and so when you, uh, you're going back to America, um, how long do you plan on working? You plan on retiring in the Philippines or coming back here? What's your? Yeah, well, you're I, a young guy. I mean, what's your plans for the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, my fiance and I are hoping that she'll eventually be. Her and her daughter will be coming to the states to live with me and my son. Um, you know, I have a son who's still in grammar school, so you know, we're both single parents. And uh, you know, eventually, I would like to retire here in the Philippines. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm financially, I'm in a position where I could do it now, but. It's, my son needs me, and there's really, at his age, there's really no opportunities for him over here. He's just starting out in life. Um, so that's what kind of keeps me, you know, focused on being in the U.S. But I would love to retire here in the Philippines. I'd love to stay here now, really. Uh, I, I really enjoy it here. I mean, it is a developing country, so there's some challenges. Um, I think if you're the type of person that gets easily annoyed, it might not be the place for you. But uh, for me, some of the challenges are enjoyable. You know, it's different. You know, it's a novelty. 
like I said, I, I love riding around in the tricycle. I, I think I told you earlier, I have a driver I can message him. It's got a nice new car with air conditioning. It'll take us wherever we want to go. But I love just hopping in the tricycle with my girlfriend and taking in the scenery, that sort of thing. Um, I enjoy the people here. Um, they're really friendly. Uh, you know, they seem to they seem to just be less on edge, you know, the people in the States for the most part. Yeah, talking about uh, America, because I haven't been there in three years, I spoke to my mother this morning, and she was telling me how there's this all this tension and animosity <clears throat> between Republicans and Democrats, between people that are vaccinated, unvaccinated, the um, inflation that's going on right now, <clears throat> the crime, especially in some places like California, people just walking into Walgreens and filling up their bags and walking out, taking what they want, smashing grabs, cars being broken into. And <clears throat> here in the Philippines, I mean, I've been here for three years. I just don't see, I mean, I'm sure there's crime here, but I just don't see it. I don't, I don't feel threatened here. Um, it just seems like they're peaceful people. There's no road rage here. Um, have you noticed that at all? Like, especially someone who's got a background in law enforcement, I would think you would notice things like that. I mean, being aware, you know, what's around you. And how do you feel like being here in the Philippines compared to when you're back in America? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more of a, a relaxed environment. People tend to be relaxed. I mean, there's a lot of people here that are struggling financially. I mean, their whole focus is on, you know, earning enough money to have rice for dinner. Uh, so for them to get caught up on a lot of the political and the crazy stuff that we're caught up in in America, that's just so far out of their, you know, thought process because they're worried about eating today. <laughs> you know, so there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of that type of angst going on. Um, and they seem happy. I mean, for people that, you know, have so little, I mean, not, not all Filipinos are poor. I'm not saying that I know there's people that are well off that are Filipinos, but a lot of the people that I see on a day-to-day -day basis here in the Philippines are poor. Um, you know, they're struggling to put food on the table. Um, but somehow, you know, they find a way to appreciate what little they have. And yeah, find you joy. find people here that, you know, they live in houses with dirt floors, no indoor plumbing. You know, maybe they've got a, a line that goes in, gives them electricity for some, some lights and a few basic things, but they're smiling and they're happy. Where, And I've noticed that when I go into poor neighborhoods, I mean, really poor neighborhoods in the Philippines, the people are still friendly. They're not threatening. Whereas in America, if you go to a poor neighborhood like Chicago or L.A., they're still going to get robbed. There's criminals there. <laughs> That's where the criminals are. Yeah. Where... You don't seem to see that here, you know. At least I haven't come well, across it. They don't seem to have the sense of entitlement. Like, no, you know, the people, that's a good point. A lot of people in the states that are struggling, um, they feel, you know, aggrieved. Really, they feel aggrieved. Like there's an entitlement factor there, and uh, they're angry. You know, they seem to be angry about their station in life, and you know, kind of blaming everybody else or the system. And over here in the Philippines, it's different. You know, people they don't seem to blame anyone else. They just Hey, let, let me work. Let me make some money. Let me, you know, put food on the table. You know, buy some red horse, and uh, I'm happy. You know, so in the states, it's a complete contrast in culture, and uh, I, I, I kind of enjoy it. You know, just the upbeat attitude. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy the Filipino people. And that's not to say that there's some Filipinos out there that are, you know, that might be criminals. They might be bad. You know, obviously that's humanity. You know, that's people all around the world, but. In general, you know, my experience has been really positive. So what's your plans for the future as far as your business? Um, do you see yourself retiring when you're 65? Or do you think that you'll keep on doing this? I mean, it sounds like, I guess you're more administrative now and managed, but you're not actually out in the field that, that much. Not very well. Occasionally, I, I hit the field. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, like I said, doing administrative work as the president of the National Association and the International Bounty Hunter Union. So. Um, there's a lot of administrative and leadership in public relations, you know, like doing television interviews, Banfield. I think I mentioned I used to do The Real Story with Gretchen Carlson when she was on Fox News. So I do a lot of that. Um, as far as retiring goes, I mean, I'd like to be retired right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if the stock market hadn't tanked, I might be a little bit closer to it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, eventually I do. I, you know, I, I'd love to retire by the time I'm 50. If I can, you know, uh, God willing, I'd love to retire by the time I'm 50. Um, you know, watching your friend Paul McGill's show, one of the things he said on there, and I think he said it more than once, is he likes not having to show up. And that really resonated with me. Um, the thought of that, I'm thinking, to not be on a schedule and constantly having to worry about, I've got to do this on this day, and I've got to be here at this time, and I've got to do this and this. 
um, and just be able to wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm with it. I'll, I'll figure out what I want to do, you know, as I go along. That's real freedom, in my opinion. It is. Know? That's what I've got. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you guys have. Not having to show up <laughs> unless you want to. Right. You know. Um, so that's my goal in life: is to not have to show up unless I feel like it. You know. Mm. Well, especially when you've got a job that you know sounds like could be dangerous. Even though I realize you're not doing that so much that now, but you know, there must have been times when it was dangerous. You go and wake up in the morning. You know, you're going after a really bad guy. It sounds a little scary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in this line of work, you know, every time you go out and work a case, there's always that risk. You know, we've just recently we've had some, you know, uh, fugitive recovery agents, also known as bounty hunters, that have been killed. Um, you know, we're talking about a few in the last couple of months. Uh, so yeah, there's always that risk going out there doing this kind of work that you're not going to come home. So if you can make your money and get out while you still have your health and your sanity <laughs> that's a plus i had a question i forgot to ask earlier let's say uh, somebody skips down on a hundred thousand dollar bail and you capture them how much of that do you get or what's the reward on something like that yeah uh it, generally it's about 10 percent um there are different variables you know if they say if they're wanted in a different state uh you know or if there's a real short time to the forfeiture if the bail bond company is got two weeks before they got to pay out you can, sometimes you can negotiate a higher price 20 25 percent depending on the circumstances um, I always charge more if, if they hired somebody else and that person wasn't able to you know clear the case and you're coming in behind somebody else they may have already stirred up a hornet's nest and tipped people off and it makes the case more difficult so I'll charge a little bit more uh, just for an aggravation factor or the difficulty factor but it's anywhere from 10 to 25 percent, depending on the circumstances. Well, it seems like you could be chasing somebody for weeks or months, and if you don't find them, you don't make anything, right? Yeah, exactly. It, it's especially with the cost of fuel now. Yeah. <laughs> there are a small percentage of people in this line of work that are on a salary from the bail bond company, so they pretty much make the same regardless. But the vast majority of us are independent contractors, um, and it's it's completely a commission line of work. If you don't get results, you don't get paid. And whatever money you spend on your fuel or paying your informants or whatever, if you don't clear the case, then that's that's a loss. You got to write it off. Do you use uh, the internet a lot to like track people down and have yeah. that access? Is that a big help nowadays? We do. Yeah, we have a lot. I mean, we have a lot of different uh, search databases that we can use. Um, Accurate, IRB, different companies, TLO, um, sort of things where you can plug in somebody's information and it'll tell you all their past addresses, who their associates are. Um, people, you know, people that have lived at the same address, a lot of different employment information sometimes, and social media has been a big game changer in my line of work. It amazes me how many people are wanted, you know, they jump on on felony charges and they're live streaming on Facebook from a <laughs> restaurant or something. Dumb <laughs> but, criminals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Have you ever captured somebody that's been on the run for like, say, 20 years or something and living a normal life and all of a sudden they're just shocked that you finally found them after all this time? No, not in the bail bond uh, industry because by then the bail would have been forfeited. The bonding oh. company would have had to have paid out by then. So, you know, at that point, once the bond is forfeited and there's no chance of them recouping their money uh, from the bond, um, there's really no incentive for us to, to go look for anybody. So if you're a criminal, and you can stay on the run long enough where that bond expires or is no longer valid, you're a lot safer, less chance of getting captured because then you've got to count on the police really wanting you enough to track you down, right? Right. I mean, you're not going to have a bounty hunter chasing you if there's no bounty to be paid. You know, the bond has is, is, uh, been forfeited and paid off already. So, uh, But they'll still have an active warrant, you know, if they have some type of interaction with the police, law enforcement. Um, and even then, sometimes... If it's a minor charge, like a misdemeanor or even some of the lower level felonies, if it's something that it's been outstanding for like 10 or 20 years, every so often like a sheriff's office will go in and they'll audit their warrants and they might get with the local district attorney or state's attorney and say, hey, do you want to just cancel this out? Um, you know, we haven't found this person. It's been 10 years. The charge is minor. Who knows if we even still have the evidence? So they might just cancel a warrant and, uh, you know. Do they let the person know? <laughs> no, they won't tell them. Uh, you know, they, they usually won't contact. I mean, if they knew where they were, they would have, you know, apprehended them. But, yeah, so sometimes, you know, these fugitives that skip out and hide out for a long time, sometimes it pays off. But then you, they're spending all those years looking over their shoulder, too. Who wants to live like that? Well, 
fascinating. Well, um, I really appreciate your time and sharing your story with us, and uh, hope next time you're in the Philippines, we can spend more time together, and uh, best of luck with everything. I sure will. Thanks for having me, Mark. My pleasure. Bye. <laughs>